to Generation Changes Church, where we are changing generations with the love and message of Jesus Christ and putting our faith into action every day. If you are not a member of a local body, we invite you to connect with us either at our Donaldson or our Lebanon campus or join our online campus by texting the word online to 615-488-7151. Let's do life together. So grab your Bibles, your pens, and your journals, and let's get ready for another amazing worship experience. Well, we are in a series on mission, vision, and culture. Say that with me. Mission, vision, and culture. Those three words govern an entity. Those three words propel any entity, and we're going to talk about them as they pertain to this church that God has raised up in Middle Tennessee. Today, we're going to take a trip down memory lane and acquaint some of us who have never heard the story of how all of this began and how it formed the church that you see today. It began way back as we were partying like it was 1999, because it was, <laughs> when my family and I attended a revival at the Carpenter's House in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We were dressed in street clothes, not dressed like ministers, no jackets, no anything. We went to see what the fuss was about because this revival had been going on literally for months and months and months and months, night after night after night. So all of the family in their street clothes walked in to this revival meeting. We sat about the second row, far over in the corner as we could get. And this particular minister was one who functioned quite a bit in the prophetic ministry, in that of giving a word to someone that God gives to them uh, to somehow impact their lives. And it just so would happen that when we walked in and we sat down and the preacher got up to share the word, he came over and he asked, are you all together? And dad said, yes. He said, would you all please stand? So my whole family, first time to this revival meeting as a family together, got stood up in front of everybody. That's exactly what you want to happen when you go to a new church, right? Is you want the preacher to come say, get up, stand up in front of everybody. Well, that's what happened. And he began to give a word of prophecy to my dad and say to him that God would appoint him or has appointed him as a spokesman at the city gates of Nashville, Tennessee. The only problem was he was a bishop in Kentucky, over 80 churches and about 400 ministers and thousands of people. He did not even live here. Well, some prophet he is. Until... Four years later, boy, I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version because there was a lot that transpired through all of this. Four years later, at the ripe young age of 60 years old, my dad, my mom, walked away from 40 years with one organization. They had built a career. They had a name that was recognizable. They had all the prestige that comes with the office that he held. And they said goodbye to all of that because God had spoken a word and came to town literally with no guarantee but the word of God. But here's the good news. When you've got a word from the Lord, you've got more than you need. All you have to do is say yes. 6,400 square feet in what is now the nursery and the cafe and the kitchen area. 63 people, September the 1st, 2003. Ten of those people were in the family. Most of the others were friends of ours in town that came to see what was going to happen the first night. And Dad showed up with a word that declared to the church that God is up to something, and boy, was he right. This church today that exists as Generation Changers Church was at that time called River of Life Ministry Center. You can't even put an acronym to that. Okay, it, it would sound like you were speaking in tongues almost if you tried to put the acronym to that. And there were a handful of faithful, wonderful, good, godly people that had been waiting on God to move. Well, God moved first through his word. 
And that word, do you have any pictures of that first night for me right quick? There we, there we are. There's my wife over in the corner. You see her over there by, by, by Miss Sarah and the flags over there. And, and, and this was night one. Now, you don't have any more pictures, do you? It don't. Now, wait just a minute. Those are locks of love. I have donated them to the pastorate of this church. Okay? Understand that. But God is up to something was the claim. And things began immediately to prove that word as true. It's interesting that in 2010, 11 years after the 1999 prophecy, a man walks in my dad's office at that time and says, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. See, he had heard the story on a number of occasions of how God was appointing a man as a spokesman at the city gates of Nashville, Tennessee. At that moment in 2010, the community of Donaldson erected a little gate shack with a gate at it that commemorated that in the 1800s, the toll gate to the city of Nashville is two blocks down the road. So we see the word was not only powerful, it was precise. When God speaks, you can count on it. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now, this church that is now two campuses in two locations with two locations of a preschool and an online campus all began with nothing but a word from God. But what is interesting is there's another passage of Scripture that really set the foundation for the church we all enjoy being a part of today, or at least I enjoy it. We all enjoy the benefits of today. And it's a passage found in the book of John, chapter 5. Now, this was a concept that God had given to my father years before, and he had tried with several ministers at several churches to see it come to pass, but what we did not realize altogether what is that it was a concept or an inspiration that God had given to him and was choosing to use him to see it come to pass. See, not every word God gives you is for somebody else. Just remember that. Now, let's look to John chapter 5. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which is in Aramaic, it's called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Those are porches. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, saying, do you want to get well? In the King James Version, the Bible says, Wilt thou be made whole? I was wondering if they got the cue that the sick people were coming to the porch. Sir, he replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. I want to begin by sharing the history of the pool. It was not originally a place for sick people. It was a primary water source in the city of Jerusalem, and it was so rich in mineral, minerals that people believed it had healing properties. And so, as this pool, as they called it, became more popular, the religious, the elite, the affluent all got together and claimed the pool as their own. And they literally built five porches around it on which those who were on the in crowd or in the in crowd could lay around the pool, relax, and enjoy themselves. It had a splendor like the pool of Siloam. Man, I've got some good-looking sick people up here this morning, don't I? Show me that picture of the pool of Siloam. This is, is some of what is left there today. But it was a splendid place. It was, it was mar there was marble everywhere. And, of course, granite. And, and it was a place that was designed for the people who were in the upper echelon in society to come and just relax and get away from all the other hurting and sick people. Okay? It was a popular hangout. It was the Jerusalem Country Club. <laughs> What a picture of the religious structure of the day of Jesus. It had become an exclusive club for people who were in the in crowd, and they kept the sick people out because if you had certain sicknesses and diseases, you weren't allowed in the temple. 
And sadly, it is also a picture of what the modern day church has become in many places. It has become a social club where people come to hand out their business cards. It has become a place where it's about taking care of the constituents, keeping the people happy, and the hurting, and the people that really need what's going on are not even welcome in some churches. I told you last week that some people left this church because we were welcoming anybody. Just hold on, it's going to get gooder, I promise. But here's the thing. After a while, the spring that fed the pool of Bethesda dried up. And the water became stagnant, hot, and nasty. And they had built five porches around it so no wind could blow. There was no hope for the water getting better, so everybody deserted the pool of Bethesda. It's exactly what happens when the church becomes a place of social gathering. The spring dries up, the water gets stagnant, and the people scatter. I could use a praying church today because this is going to get in deeper. Now, the Bible says when they left, the Bible starts talking about a great number of sick people gathered around the pool. And the King James Version uses three words to describe them, blind, halt, and withered. The word blind not only meant not being able to see, but people who literally had no eyes, it was, they were helpless to ever be able to see. It's exactly the spiritual condition that was described last week when Paul said the God of this age has blinded the minds of the people so that they cannot see the glory of the gospel of Christ. Secondly, the word halt means maimed as through an accident they lost a limb. And that describes a lot of people in today's culture that have been traumatized by the things they've been through in life. They're injured relationally. They're injured emotionally. They're injured physically. They're injured in so many different ways, and they need a place of healing. And then there's the word withered, which is the Greek word zeros, and that is the word from which we get the English word zero. There were people on that porch society said are zeros. There is no help. There's no need in investing in them. They're never going to be more than they are right now. These were the kind of people that were on the porch. If someone dropped you off at the pool, they were saying, we're done with you. We can do nothing else for you. You have no hope in this life. Yet, with all of the sickness and disease that was going on at the porch, these people still gathered with hope. Part of verse 3 and verse 4 is missing in most of the modern translations. But you can find it if you go back to the King James and it says this. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, and withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. Now... They all gathered, waiting on the water to move. But the problem was, the thing that moved the water was gone. The spring could no longer move it and refresh it. The porches were built around it, so the wind could no longer blow on it and refresh it. If there was going to be anything that moved the water, it wasn't coming from beneath, and it wasn't coming from around, it was coming from above. Hear me. Hear me, the condition of the body of Christ today is not going to be changed from beneath us. And it's not going to be changed when we look around us and find some great idea that's working somewhere else somewhere. The only way the water is going to be moved is if something moves it from above. If people are going to get what they need, it's not going to come from around or below. It's going to come from above. Wow. They believed the angel would come down and stir the water, and the first one in would be made whole. It was a place where sick people gathered with hope. And where sick people gather with hope, it becomes a place of healing. Now, it was not originally called the Pool of Bethesda. That's the name the sick people gave to it. Because the sick people had more of an appreciation for the pool than the people who built it. 
It's amazing to me how people can be in a church so long that they lose an appreciation for the family of God, and they lose an appreciation for what God's doing in that church, but somebody comes in off the street that's hurting and needing healing, and they have a deep appreciation for what God is doing. Hear me. The word Bethesda can be captured in three phrases. The first phrase is this, a house of goodness. The second phrase is this, a house of grace. And I like this third word, a house where mercy is poured out. What a perfect description of what the church should be today. A house where God's goodness is experienced. A house where God's grace is encountered. And a house where the mercies of the Lord are new every morning and poured out upon every soul that is beaten down by the sin that so burdens them. Understand that is the message of this house. We are a house of grace and mercy. Before my parents came to, down, to town, my dad set all of his kids down and he said something. I'm not interested in coming to town to build a social club with religious overtones. We see that's what causes the water to get stagnant. That's, we see that's what brings spiritual death. And it set a tone. We were established as a house of grace and mercy flooded with healing waters. Now, I want to look at three things there that happened, and, and if you're not careful, you'll, you'll, you'll remember two of them, but you'll forget the most important one. First of all, at this place called Bethesda, there was a pool. There was no power in the pool until what happened in heaven came down and touched the pool. And, and while there was no power in the pool, it represented the hope by which all people gathered. Hear me now. They had a hunger for their lives to change. The reason they came together with all of their sickness and disease is that they had hope that they were not assigned that condition permanently, but that something could change in their life. But you will see in the story, there's nothing really exciting about the pool itself unless you were one person that happened to be fortunate enough to get there first. It was just a symbol of hope. There were five porches that surrounded this pool. And as we began to see this vision unfold on a larger scale, we began to understand that God was calling Generation Changers Church to be a church with five locations in the Middle Tennessee area to build five porches where people who were sick could gather with hope in their heart that their life could change. Hear me. Today, we have a campus right here in Nashville, right here on Stewart's Ferry Pike. We have a beautiful 12-acre campus out on 840 on Wildcat Way that, by the way, God just this past week paid off for us, and we're so grateful for it. We have another campus that is nothing but a Christian preschool, and I say nothing but, but it's a very important thing, but it's a Christian preschool over on Leeville Pike in Lebanon. We have an online campus that we're fostering right now, getting off the ground so that we can reach beyond our physical borders. See, here's the thing. I'm not sure exactly what all the five porches will look like, but I know this. We have decided to believe God and not limit God, not get ahead of God and not drag behind God, but move as God moves, to move as he says move. We will walk through the doors he opens. We will walk away from the doors he closes. Come on, somebody. This is because this began with God's direction and it can only continue with God's direction. By the way, I didn't really see all of that until a series of events took place in my life. Pastor Eric Gilbert, who is one of the founding preachers of this house. How many of you know Pastor Eric? You've been in service with him. You know he's an anointed, anointed man of God. He was praying for our church one day, and he sent me a text and said, Barry, I believe based on John chapter 5, the word that God gave to your dad, that, that your church will have five campuses in the middle Tennessee area. And I was like, all right. <laughs> Not too excited to tell you the truth at first. Until a guy by the name of Dr. Bob Rogers came by here one day who had several campuses in the Kentucky, state of Kentucky whose ministry reaches around the world, owns television networks, all this kind of stuff, touches people literally around the globe. And God sent him by here one day for some reason, and we learned that it ended up he was supposed to come by and pray something in, into our lives. And I stood there, and Dr. Bob said, I want to pray for you. 
And he started praying. I'm going, bring it on, Jesus. Whatever you got, Jesus, just bring it on. And the man stops praying. He says, God, you said you would give this young man a city. Now give it to him. He said, Barry, I believe you are to have five campuses in the Middle Tennessee area. He said, but if you're going to take a city, you need to be on television. We were not on television at the time. We don't, and I still look and go, I don't get it. You know, I'm not as pretty as Joyce Meyer. I'm telling you right now, when I get on camera, I look bad. And, and he said, and you need a school. God wants to give you a school. You've you got to have a school. I said, yes, sir. Walked away from that word, but said, before you finish and leave here, I got a text I want to read to you that had come in 30 days earlier from a man that did not even know this man who was praying with us, who, was, who said the very same thing. And you know what? Today, we are on the road to five campuses, and not only that, we already have a Christian preschool. We are already ministering on television here in the Middle Tennessee area, and there's a chance that that's going to go national in the near future. What are you saying? I'm saying, that's nothing. Listen, that's nothing about me. It's not even about the man who at 60 years old said yes to God. When God wants to do something, all he's looking for is somebody to say yes. And you may be believing in your own life that God has a big purpose over you. But guess what? The same God that has a purpose over my life has a purpose over your life. And it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about what he wants to do in the earth. And if you'll just say yes to God, come on somebody. If you'll just say yes to God, God will move. But it's not about the porches. And I don't get over excited about the five campus vision. I get excited about the third part of this story. There was a pool. There were porches. But there was a person that walked in one day. His name is Jesus. See, John chapter 5 is not a story about a pool. It's not a story about five porches. It's a story about what happens when one soul encounters Jesus Christ. See, we don't, we don't want to be a church where people place their faith in the pool. We don't want to be a church where people are fixated on the porches. We want to be a church where it's all about Jesus. We want to be the church where helpless doesn't mean hopeless. Can I say that again? We want to be the church where helpless doesn't mean hopeless. We want to be the church where people encounter Jesus. We want to be a church that can offer the healing that people need. But let me give you the concept of the process of the healing that takes place. First of all, mercy lets us in. See, the five porches were a covering for a community that all had something in common. It had been a place where people relaxed. Now it was where people came when they were sick. But the porches provided them a covering from the hot Middle Eastern sun. Otherwise, they would have been laid along the streets. They would have been laid at the city gates in the scorching hot sun. So there was a mercy element to the porches that said, no matter how sick you are, you are welcome here. See? All of us come through the door of the house of God with the same sickness. These people had different symptoms but they were all sick. And all of us who walk through these doors week after week and who join online week after week, we all come in with the same sickness. We may have different symptoms of that sickness, but the sickness we have is the sin in our lives. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But mercy says, come on in just like you are. Mercy says, you may be sick, you may have this symptom, and you may have that symptom, but all of us are welcome on the porch. Listen, you need to tell everybody you know in your life in Middle Tennessee, there is a church where you can come to no matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. Mercy lets you in. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Go find the people nobody else wants and tell them there's a church for them. Wow. When people come to the house of God, they should be embraced in their present condition. A lot of churches like for you to go through some sort of proving period. Not this one. You can't prove anything. Because you can't do anything about your condition. 
if we could do anything about our own condition, Jesus would have not had to go to the cross. Are you hearing me? Understand, mercy lets us all in, but grace calls us out. One who was been there, had been an invalid for 38 years, the Bible says. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Again, King James Version, wilt thou be made whole? First of all, Jesus saw him. Everybody else saw sick people. Jesus saw the man behind the sickness. When people walk through the doors of this church that we don't know, we have to see them. We have to see them when they ride in in a brand new Mercedes. And we have to see them when they drive their 1972 Pinto station wagon. Don't laugh. My dad tried to pawn that off on me as my first car. But understand, people have to be seen. And I charge and challenge every person that is a part of the Generation Changers Church movement. When you see people walk through the door you've never seen before, see them. Fixate your eyes. That, 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 that phrase was Christ literally examined him. He saw him in his situation, but he saw a person behind the sickness that was greater than the sickness that he carried. And listen, everybody that walks in bears the image of the same creator, no matter if sin has marred that image. We know the one who has come to restore it. Somebody give God some praise in this house now. We refuse to let your infirmity become your identity. The Bible says Jesus saw he had been that way a long time. The word time is chronos. That's where we get the English word uh, uh, chronic. This man had a chronic condition that was never going to get better. It was only going to get worse, and he was helpless to do anything about it. That describes us in our sins. It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And we are helpless to do anything about it on our own. See, this was a man, I want you to think about it. He had seen healing but never received it. He had watched people year after year go down to the pool and saw a miracle happen for somebody else, but it hadn't happened for him. And I believe God's church today is full of people who've seen miracles but never received them. I believe God's church is full of people who've seen lives changed, but their lives have never been changed. They've laid on the porch in the mercies of God, and they've never encountered the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, having seen this, Jesus asked him a pointed question. Wilt thou be made whole? Here's the best translation I can get of that. Do you want your life back? The life you were supposed to live without this sickness. The life I created you to live. Do you want it back? Why would Jesus ask a man that had been there 38 years that question? I'll tell you why. Because for 38 years, his infirmity has been his identity. And he had used that identity to be dependent upon everybody else. But Jesus says, because when you get whole, you're going to have a new identity that includes personal responsibility. <laughs> you're going to have a new identity where people aren't given to you, but you're going to be given to people. You're going to have an identity where you're not going to be the object of someone helping you, but you're going to be helping somebody else. Do you want your life back? Let me ask you a question today. The life that sin has taken away from you, do you want your life back? Do you want the life that God gave you and intended for you to live? Now, I, I, man, I've got to hurry. Jesus said, do you want to get well? And, and, the, and the first word is right. He says, sir, which is the Greek word for Lord, it recognized a person of authority. So he says, person of authority, I'm only here because of other people. I have no man to help me. It's interesting how people have tragedies in life that leave them sick and beaten down, and they live in that brokenness blaming other people. You can lay on the bed of blame 
or you can answer the call of Jesus, rise, take up your mat and walk. Because see, sick people, the people that may have knocked you down can't stand up for you. You have to have the faith to stand up on your own. When Jesus gives you the invitation and has the authority to cause you to rise, you can't look back and say, I can't stand up because of what happened to me in my past. Listen, when you meet Jesus, it doesn't matter what's happened in your past. Those people have no power over you anymore. That devil has no power over you anymore. That sin has no power over you anymore. You can get up, but nobody else is getting up for you. Wow. See, Welcome to the porch, but you have a limited time to stay there because I don't want you battling with the same thing for a decade. I don't want you giving 20 years to an addiction. I don't want you giving 20 years to an old relational hurt. I don't want you giving 20 years to something that happened to you 20 years before, and now you've given it 40 years. No, sirree. I believe this is a place where people can come and encounter Jesus, where first you will be loved in your broken condition. You will be accepted in your broken condition, but we love you too much to leave you there. We want to introduce you to the man who can give you your life back. You know, if Jesus were here today, he would say, get up. Take off your sign because that's not who you are anymore. Depression and anxiety. There's so many people. It's eating, it's eating the hearts and minds of our society up. And I'm going to tell you what, we're trying to medicate it. We're trying to counsel it out of people. I understand, but I believe there's one who can heal a broken mind that's riddled with anxiety. I believe he's a peace speaker. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? And he can say to you, rise, take up your bed and walk. Oh, you're sick with sin. We all were. But if Jesus were here, see, the religious people would leave you here. Because you're about to break the rules when I tell you to do what you're about to do. It was the Sabbath. If you walk too much on the Sabbath, you've broken the religious rule. If you carry anything on the Sabbath, you've broken the religious rule. But Jesus didn't care about man-made rules. He cared about one thing that was making sick people well. And Jesus says to those who are bound by sin, rise, take up your sign, get rid of your sign. It's not who you are anymore. Your sign says addiction. And you represent a large portion of today's population that are addicted chemically. They're addicted relationally. They're addicted to brokenness. They're addicted to everything. But you know, when Jesus comes in, he says, you know what? I love you while you're addicted, but get up. I love you too much to leave you that way. Take off your sign. It's not who you are anymore. Oh, your sign says broken relationships. The divorce rate in the church is the same as the world. But the first attack that Satan ever landed in the earth was an attack between a man and his wife. And he's been attacking marriages and families ever since. But there's a lot of you who've been through the tragedy of divorce, and you've come in broken, and you've come in hurting. Some of you have come in as children of divorce, and it has scarred your heart. But you know what the Jesus I know says to you, rise, take off your sign. That's not who you are anymore. Do you want your life back? Come out here with me so everybody can see this. Oh, this is a big one. What does your sign say? Church hurt. There's unchurched people in this world and there's de-churched people in this world. They've been de-churched through narcissists in the pulpit. They've been de-churched through people of authority in the kingdom. They've been de-churched because people they followed broke down in their own relationship with God and failed. And the city is full of people like this and this country is full of people like this. But I want you to know something. 
You can't let church hurt keep you from the life God wants you to have. And if you're here because you've experienced church hurt, I want to invite you today to rise, get up, and take off your sign. That's not who you are anymore. Did you hear what I tell you? You are a child of the Most High God. Do you want your life back? Do you want your life back? Do you want your life back? You can have the life God intended for you to have in Jesus' name. Wow. You guys can be excused. The religious people would have rather him laid there lame than to pick up his mat and carry it into the temple court. Jesus is always ticking religious people off. Because religious people don't understand grace. <laughs> See, just like this man, nobody ever thought he was chronic. Nobody ever thought he'd get better. But Jesus saw the man behind the sickness and saw the potential for a better life. And I'm telling you, get ready, Generation Changers Church. God's going to save some people that you don't think he can save. God's going to change some people in your family that you've had a hard time relating to, and you're going to have to relearn to relate to the new them. Did you hear me? You're going to have to learn to relate to the new them when God gets done with them. And there's a lot of people that are going to be carrying some things around that the church ain't ready for. They're going to have a testimony some of us ain't ready to hear. Some of us have never been exposed to the life of addiction. Some of us have never been exposed to a life of prostitution. Some of us have never been exposed to slave trafficking. Some of us have never been in the deepest darkness of pits. We've lived a sheltered life. And we're going to hear some stories our ears aren't quite ready for. But you know what? That mat that used to represent his sickness now was his story of how Jesus came to him and set him free. And God wants to turn your sickness into your story. He wants to turn your trial into your testimony. That's what happens when a person meets Jesus. Are you ready? Are you ready to see God save some people that can't be saved according to religion? Just go on and get on your feet. You want to anyway. Hear me. God's about to do a work in people's lives that you never thought he could do. But the story didn't stop here. It always does with every sermon and you hear on it. But long about verse 14 or so, the Bible says Jesus found him later and said, you've been made well. Now go and sin no more so that something worse doesn't happen to you. We believe at this church. Well, I'm just going to tell you from a personal perspective, I am not interested in an emotional experience that lasts 60 seconds where you cry and feel better, but you go back and yield what God has done to what Satan used to do. I'm preaching harder than you're praying this morning, I think. Understand something. Last week alone, between the two campuses, 14 people surrendered their life to Jesus Christ at Generation Changers Church. But if you are one of those 14, don't yield what God has done in you to what Satan wants to do to you. What Jesus was saying, you got your life back. Don't go back and let sin take it away from you. Are you hearing me? Don't let the devil rob you of what I've done for you. That's why we believe in the preaching of the Word of God, because we believe it will lead you to a life where you don't surrender what God has done in you to what Satan wants to do to you. We believe that the Word of God will give a light to our path and a lamp to our feet and will guide us in the place of wholeness and wellness and not back to the same old things that took our life away to begin with so if you're hurting welcome to the porch but if you want to get well come see Jesus do you want your life back has your infirmity become your identity when people look at you do they label you with your struggle is that all that they see? I know a man who sees more in you than that. And that's what this church is all about, seeing people the way Jesus sees them and the potential they have if they'll just get to Jesus.
with every head bowed and every eye closed, the campus pastor's coming, Pastor Blake. He's going to give you an invitation to get your life back in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you were encouraged to put your faith into action. And remember, if you're not a member of a local body, you can connect with us at our Donaldson or Lebanon campus, or join us online by texting the word online to 615-488-7151. And remember one last thing, God loves you, and so does GC Church.